I'm Alan Woodward. Um, I'm quite a lot of things, actually. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to say I'm one thing. Um, I suppose one of the reasons I'm here today is because I'm a visiting professor at the University of Surrey. Um, but my background is chequered, I think is the best way to put it. Um, I started off as a physicist, um, as an undergraduate, uh, and then I crossed the road to the engineering faculty to do my postgrad research. Um, and I was actually meant to be studying something quite different, but got very interested in signal processing. And bear in mind, this is in the mists of time, this is back in the deep dark 80s, when personal computers were just coming along, and we were using big mainframes to try and do a lot of these things, and also dedicated uh, chipsets to try and actually do the signal processing. Um, so I got very interested in signal processing, and my old tutor actually came across as well, who taught me quantum physics. He came across and got very interested in uh, a new form of computing, which was based on a, a new chip called the transputer, which everybody would have forgotten about. Um, but the transputer and a programming language called Occam, which is all about parallel computing. Um, and we were looking to do all sorts of different things with this, all around signal processing and a thing called quantum simulation. Um, what happened then was slightly unusual. I got recruited to go and work for the government because it turned out that some of the things I'd been discovering and working out in my signal processing, um, which was what I shouldn't have been studying in the first place, um, was of interest to them. So I went off and worked for um, several government agencies uh, for a few years, uh, doing signal processing, then image processing, then back to signal processing again. Um, and then in the early 1990s, the Cold War came to a sudden end. Um, and they decided, these various government agencies, that um, they didn't need people like me anymore, and the threat had all gone away. So a um, chap who was my commanding officer left, joined a company called Logica, as it then was, um, and said to me, come on, why don't you come with me? So off we went, uh, doubled our salaries, um, and very quickly the government decided there was a threat after all, so they needed us back. So we started hiring ourselves back as consultants at exorbitant rates. Um, and that's really what I ended up doing for about 10 years through a stage where I started my own business. A number of us that had been in this company, Logica, left. We started our own business, um, which we then floated on the stock exchange back in the early 2000s. Um, I remained a director for a while. Um, but um, having floated it, etc., I then got involved back in academia. Um, and that's when I got involved with the University of Surrey, where I'm now visiting professor, doing research into all sorts of different things. Um, one of the really interesting things I've discovered on my way through my government service and also hiring ourselves back to the government as contractors and consultants um, was that law enforcement, security services, intelligence services, uh, they were very interested in what was then called InfoSec, information security. Now information security is what everyone now calls cyber security. Um, and it turned out I had a talent because I quite liked taking things apart and misusing them. Um, I was quite good at finding ways of, that things shouldn't be used. And so really from about the early 2000s onwards, I started getting much more involved with cybersecurity. Um, and that's really where I'm specialising today and certainly what uh, the background I've been doing with my research at universities, but also what I do with people like the European Cybercrime Centre at Europol in The Hague and places like that. I, I get really passionate about technology, not for its own sake. One of the things I discovered in my postgraduate, in fact, really it was in my undergraduate years because um, we had to book time on computers to use them and you would do things on punch cards that you would hand through a hole to a high priestess who a couple of days later would hand you back the results. Um, then we actually had access to our own computers and we could build our own bits and pieces. And suddenly I thought, I wasn't so much interested in how it worked, but what you could do with it. Um, particularly in, initially in the world of uh, signal processing, but also, People building things, and this is where my cybersecurity comes from, building things that actually people never thought that it would be used in that way, or worse, misused in that way. And that's really what all of cybersecurity boils down to. Quite often, people haven't thought. They've built things with the best of intentions. They make things highly usable. They make things fantastically convenient. But of course, those are the direct enemies of security. And what then happens is people come along and they misuse them. And it turns out I'm quite good at that um, and finding out ways that you shouldn't use things. And so that's really why I've stayed in cybersecurity all this time. I'm a bit of an intellectual butterfly. I'm at that stage in my career where I know a little bit about a lot and not a lot about anything in particular. Um, but it turns out there's a couple of areas where that's quite useful. One, one of them is um, 
quantum computing. Now, it's not quantum computing per se that I'm interested in, but the impact it has on security, because it turns out that quantum computing, which is something I first came across with my old tutor back in the 80s, um, when you couldn't build them, but now you can start to build them, they have a direct impact on cryptography and modern cryptography. Uh, and so what we've got to look for are things that are quantum resistant. So when, it's not a case of if, but when these quantum computers come on stream and they start breaking all that cryptography that we all use every day, what are we going to do about it? What's, what are the, the methods, the, the new forms of cryptography that we can move on to? So I suppose that's what I'm spending most of my time thinking about at the moment. But I do spend a lot of time, um, particularly when I'm advising things like law enforcement agencies and security services, etc. A lot of that is about um, cybercrime and cybersecurity in general. Um, so I do spend quite a lot of time still fiddling with tool sets. I mean, most of the people that are in pen testing will be familiar with Kali and all those sort of things we show the students. I still spend quite a bit of time fiddling with that. Uh, and hence today we got this um, capture the red flag going on. Those are quite interesting. I wouldn't put myself up against any of these guys because they're horribly clever and they're so much better than I will ever be because I've forgotten. I am so rusty because you really need to stay hands on with this stuff. But it does draw me back. I do like I do think I wonder how you get into that. And so you, you do fire it up and have a have a go. Well, cybersecurity and cybercrime, I mean, it's quite interesting. If you look at cybercrime, I mean, we've now passed the point where in the UK, cybercrime um, is worth more than the drugs industry, uh, as in the criminal drugs industry. Um, so cybercrime is really, in some ways, cybercrime is just crime now. I mean, why walk into a bank with a sawn-off shotgun when you can sit in another country and earn 10 times as much? Uh, no risk, loads more money. Um, the average return for a cyber criminal, they invest, they hire clever people to build um, attack mechanisms. Their average return is 1,500%. Um, I wish my bank would give me that. So you can see why it's drawing so much of organised crime into it. So cyber crime, cyber security is kind of, I think it's now one of the top four main threats that the UK government sees to the UK. You know, there's the obvious ones like terrorist threats, etc. But it's right up there. So there's nothing much more important, really, in terms of our daily lives. And particularly if you look at something like um, quantum computing and the effect that could have on cryptography, suddenly, if it, if it suddenly started to be viable and could work, all the crypto that we totally depend on at the moment would just disappear. It would be, it would be rendered useless. So imagine a completely... In, you think the, the internet is insecure at the moment. Imagine something where there was no security and suddenly you can see how important these things are. My concern is that... Uh, well, it's several fold. First, I'm concerned about the level of criminality on the web and some of it, certainly through my work, that sort of things you hear about through people like Europol and various law enforcement agencies, there are some really nasty people on the web. There are some really deep, seedy corners on the web. Um, you take something like the paedophiles, for example, they're having, they're, it's a heyday for them at the moment. You know, there, there are parts of the dark web where you can buy the most extraordinary things, including weapons of mass destruction, you know, the component parts for nerve gas, that people are selling things on the web that you just, would, it beggars belief, it really does, but people are willing to do it. So what worries me is that we're going to lose control, we'll lose the arms race. At the moment, the law enforcement agencies are kind of holding their own, but technologies are coming along all the time. And the trouble is, things that are good um, you know, for us sometimes are good for our enemies and the criminals as well. And you, know, you get a better form of encryption, suddenly that's good for the criminals as well. So that there is this sort of dynamic tension all the time. My other big concern is that a lot of security that's devised and designed, you know, people like me try and build bigger and better mousetraps. One of the problems is that the, too much onus is put on the users. Um, and you take something as simple as passwords. We're doing a lot of work at Surrey, for example, at the moment on passwords. Because how many accounts do you have? How many passwords do you have? Suddenly, it's no longer the case of when the whole concept of passwords is created back in the days where we had dumb terminals and you had one password to remember. Um, you know, it's no longer like that. We've got 50, 60 passwords and it's so easy to reuse them, produce weak passwords, etc. And really, that's a really good example where the onus is all being put back on the user. So we need to look for better ways of doing it. And security can come in three forms. You know, there's the, the something you know, passwords, the something you are, the biometrics, or the something you have. We've all got the dongle from the bank or whatever it happens to be. So maybe we need to be looking at some combination of those where you don't always need as strong a password, but, you know, you go for two-factor authentication. There are ways around these things. But so far, a lot of the onus has been put 
on the users. And I actually don't think it's fair on users. Most users, um, they want to treat this like a television. They want to press the button, they want it to come on, and they want it to be secure. So we've got to start designing things like that. And unfortunately, at the moment, there's not a huge amount of work has been done. It's starting to be done, but it's all about the human in the loop. And it's really interesting that cybersecurity has become this multidisciplinary subject where all of a sudden, it's not just engineers like me. You get an engineer to design something for a user and it'll turn out to be the most awkward thing to use. But get a psychologist involved and suddenly they can tell you how real humans behave and how they're going to interact and you can start to design that in. So suddenly you can have things that make a lot more sense from a user's perspective but are equally secure from an engineer's perspective. And that's what worries me is we're not doing quite enough of that and we need to be doing much more of that. I actually think what's going to happen is quantum, quantum computing, I think, is going to happen. It's not a case of if, it's a case of when. When I first heard about it back in the 1980s, it was all first mooted, we just didn't have the engineering expertise. Now we do. I've been using a five qubit processor that IBM have made available. You know, Google are talking about a 50 qubit processor the next year. Suddenly you start to see, if you look back at the history of how chipsets developed in conventional computers, we all heard of Moore's law. Um, doubling every 18 months, put that into quantum computing, suddenly by 2020, which is not that far away, you could have quantum computers that, yes, they may be half the size of a room, but that's when I came into computing, when computers were like that. So in a lifetime, we're suddenly going to have things that are sitting under the desk and you, you treat them like everyday objects. So I think quantum computing will happen um, and we'll start to see it going just like conventional computing. In terms of human-computer interaction, I think that the big thing about human-computer interaction is we need to stop these subjects being siloed. And I think one of the really good things that uh, most cyber security teams have is an understanding that it's, it's a combination of people from business, engineering, psychology, sociology. There's all sorts of different disciplines. If you're going to get a truly secure system that's usable, then you need to put all those things together. And a lot of cyber security centers, like the Cyber Academy here at Napier, I'm starting to bring a lot of those things together, albeit it might, the, the sort of the genesis of it might come out of, say, engineering, but you tend to bring those other skills in. And there's a place for all those other skills as well. So, you know, if you come out from a psychology background, cybersecurity is a place you could work. Um, in the same way, if you come out from management studies or business studies, cybersecurity is a place you can work. It needs you. Um, it's not a case of, you know, don't, don't think, oh, that's just for engineers. It's a really broad subject and it needs, it, it needs all the skills. The big thing is that um, cybersecurity is so important. We talked about it, you know, concerns. Um, we can educate users, we can make things easier for users, but the biggest problem we've got is getting people into the subject to start with, from an engineering perspective. Uh, we, we, we stand the chance in this country of having, in fact globally, of having a massive shortfall of people with the right skills. People my age are going to retire soon. Um, we want people with less grey hair still keen to the subject and to get up to speed because some of it's experience, yes, some of it's mindset, yes, but some of it is you've got to train them, you've got to, you know, they've got to go through courses like here at Napier, you've got to get them with those core skills and a bit of experience to be of use. You know, we could be like 50,000 short of these people if we don't start, you wouldn't do that in medicine, for example, you wouldn't have the hospital suddenly empty of doctors and nurses. So we've got to start thinking about it now and we've got to encourage these people in. And I have to say at the moment, as, a, as an industry, as a, as a discipline, engineering in general is not being very good at attracting people in. And cybersecurity, for some reason, I find it intensely fascinating. Most people in it you talk to are really passionate and fascinated by it. So what, what are we doing wrong? There's something we're doing wrong to not get other people to come into it. People think it's hard. People think it's complicated. It's for geeks. It's for nerds. Hopefully, what I said earlier on, it's not. And it really has relevance. You can make a huge difference these days to people's lives. So we've got to get better at getting those youngsters in and getting, oh, not even youngsters. It could be second career people, you know, move across. Um, we've got to get more people into it. And if we don't, um, there is a real chance we're going to enter a huge hole in the, in the skill base. Well, one of the really interesting things is looking at the data. And I'm a big advocate. This is another area I get interested in is data analysis, because I think um, data-driven, uh, evidence-driven decision-making is really what most of our politicians should be doing and rather than just sort of the rather emotional, emotive ways they do it at the moment. Look at the data and it tells you some really interesting stories. We've been quite successful at getting uh, young ladies to go into maths, physics, chemistry. 
Look at what happens in computing. And actually, we were quite successful up until the 90s getting them to come into the subject. And it's dropped off massively since. So something's happened. It's almost like computing is seen as being um, no longer a separate discipline. It's no longer seen as being um, separate or something distinct to do. But think about computing as a career, never mind going to cybersecurity. Computing is the science of almost everything. There isn't an industry you can't go and work in if you've got a background in computing. So in some ways, you don't need to make your decisions. Study computing and you can go off into banking, medicine, whatever you like. I mean, it's all there afterwards. It's not like one of these other degrees where you study it and you, you have to go and you know, do that subject. So we're, we're clearly not explaining something to the young ladies. It's, it's quite depressing, actually, when you see the cohort of students coming in and say you have 100 students coming in and it's gone down from like 30% of them being young ladies down to like one. And there's something's happened, something really bad has happened. I have to say, I think it's this country as well. Um, it's not a global phenomenon. If you look in places like China, we get quite a lot of students from China, um, probably a third to half of the students are women. Um, America's kind of a bit like us. Um, quite a lot of European countries are not like that. Germany's got a very good take up, women going into engineering. So there's a cultural thing. And it's very interesting, the chief scientific officer um, for the uh, trade in, what was the Department of Trade and Industry, they did a study. And they came up with a rather depressing graph, which I think probably sums it up. And they asked parents, because this isn't about people like me going out and saying how wonderful it is. A lot of this is about who really influences children to make a decision on what degree they go and what career they go into. And when you ask the parents of daughters and sons, they would rather, by a country mile, their daughter went to become a hairdresser than went to be a technician of some sort. They would rather they went to be a lawyer than be an engineer. So we need to persuade the parents and also some of the teachers at school who have no experience of engineering. We need to get across to them those key influences, just A, how much fun it can be, how interesting it be, and actually how much better paid it is. Um, if they can only persuade their children that actually you ought to think about this.